We are coming, Father Abraham, 300,000 strong, from Mississippi's winding stream and from New England's shore. A popular tune that caught the imagination of the North as it responded to President Lincoln's call for men in arms to help preserve the Union. And the villages and towns and cities of the Blackstone Valley responded as their men and even a few women enlisted for the Union cause. They were ordinary people. They were mill workers and farmers and mechanics and musicians. Ordinary men called upon to endure extraordinary events. Hi, I'm Chuck Arning. I'm a ranger with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And today we're standing on the original 40 acres of the Brooks Farm in South Worcester. June 28, 1861, this quiet farm was transformed into a very active training site for the 15th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment, better known as the Worcester County Regiment. Picture for a moment, 110 white tents set up behind me, and young boys from the Blackstone Valley learning how to be soldiers. And they drilled, and they drilled, and they drilled. Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote that war is an organized bore. And there's an awful lot of truth to that particular statement. And today we're going to examine the experiences of a soldier's life during the Civil War, a very traumatic period in American history. So join me as we take a look at the Civil War from the unique perspective of the boys of the Blackstone Valley. Every man who answered the call to save the Union would be changed forever. His family, too. Just surviving the war itself would be a major accomplishment. The best way and the most accurate way to describe the experiences of the soldiers of the Blackstone Valley is through their own words, through their diaries, through their letters. Let us hear them speak. When we were on guard nights, our guns are loaded. And if a person does not stop being warned three times, he gets the contents. That's if we can hit them. You must not think because you hear that I sleep in the water or went without anything to eat for a whole day that those are common things. The worst thing about military is guard duty. This comes once in three days or thereabouts, two hours on and four off for about 24 hours. I have to get up in the night and don't get three hours sleep at any one time. Some can drop asleep in a minute, but I can't. Excuse the dirt. I am a soldier. Our artillery fire at short intervals all night and day. I have got so that cannon does not wake me up, but the rattle of infantry will do it very quick. Roland E. Bowen, Millbury, Private, 15th, Massachusetts. The most interesting part about camp life was they were just trying to survive and they were trying to eat. The food that they ate was so bad, the, the meat was rotten, the hardtack that they ate was wormy. So a lot of the times they spent foraging, looking for things in the field to eat. Um, some of the more ingenious ones would go off and shoot live game if they could. Um, as far as when they had free time, they would play cards. Or there were other, other types of gambling that they would use, but it was, it was mostly a war of survival for them. I mean, the stories of them marching till late at night they came into camp, they were too tired to set up their tents. So they would just drop and they would sleep and then they'd have a couple hours of sleep and they'd get up and they'd start to march again. The, um, the, the thing that you read about and you talk about is as soon as this camp stops, the march stops, they'd get out their coffee and they'd drink. The coffee was the substance of their lives. Because the food was so bad, they were sick all the time, but the coffee really kept them going. Not only did they drink the coffee, they chewed the coffee. as 
or they chew chewing tobacco weed, but the, the caffeine in the coffee really kept them going. It rained the day we left Charlestown, had no tents, and were not allowed to build any fires at night. But we are all tough, and none of us died. My knapsack was mighty heavy, and about three in the morning I concluded I had gone far enough. I was tired, almost to death. I fell out and lay down to sleep. Roland E. Bowen, Millbury, Private, 15th, Massachusetts. Father, I have thought what you used to tell me, that I would see the time that I would be glad to eat what was set before me, and it has come. If I should be lucky enough to get home, I never will complain, as long as I can get salt and potatoes. Generally, camp life was uh, pretty uh, dismal for just about everybody. Um, their disease and uh, uh, living conditions were, were not uh, the greatest. Uh, diseases and sickness uh, was pretty rampant. Just for example, uh, after uh, Fredericksburg uh, in uh, uh, late December of uh, 1862, they retreated back across the Rappahannock River to wait for spring, and uh, they had approximately 140,000 men encamped on the north side of the Rappahannock River looking at the Confederates for the rest of the winter. And uh, the uh, reveille in the morning, the drums and the bugles were drowned out by the coughing of 140,000 men. It was really kind of uh, a bad situation uh, in the camp life, especially in the wintertime. So when the first soldiers came out, most of the soldiers lived in a very small area around their homes, maybe five or ten miles, that's as far as they traveled. Hmm. And when the armies were put together, you had these men from all over the country put together to these masses, and they all caught the diseases from each other that they had never been exposed to. So it, it's interesting to see, when they were first issued uniforms, they were issued the uniforms and they were dressed and the first marches out, you'd see along the sides of the road all the discarded clothes that were, were useful to them. And the soldiers that survived were the soldiers that were the strongest. As, as Greg mentioned before, two-thirds of the, of the um, casualties during the Civil War were from disease. And by the end of the war, the strongest soldiers, Darwin's theory of the strongest survived, th those are the soldiers that made it. It's and not the strength that you're thinking of today, like being muscularly strong. You might have a skinny guy from the city, from, say, Boston, who's grown up around disease and filth for his entire life, and he would have no problem in that army camp. And you take some big husky guy from, like, out in Pennsylvania or something, some six-foot-four, some farmer, who's really not had any exposure to uh, child diseases. Genetic. And he might be those one of the, the first ones, ones to go. Right. Yeah. You have to understand, too, there, there were 624,000 casualties in the little over four years of the war, and for two-thirds of them to be uh, taken uh, by disease and sickness, that uh, really uh, says a lot. The uh, sanitation, sanitary con uh, conditions were uh, pretty bad. Uh, they didn't really start... Uh, um, coming up with uh, rules and regulations and restrictions until about the mid part of the war. General Hooker, for example, uh, started a lot of things in, in the uh, Union Army, but one of the things he established, uh, uh, an, an arrest procedure for the men who uh, did not use uh, the latrine system, because the, some of the men, uh, well, you even had men uh, in, in the uh, uh, army that that didn't uh, they couldn't read they couldn't write they didn't uh, they didn't uh, uh, didn't even know what underwear was uh, and they never brushed their teeth they had to establish procedures for combing the hair in the morning and and brushing of the teeth uh, uh, a lot of the men did, didn't do that as a matter of fact there are even some uh, men that uh, uh, thought that a good healthy coating of dirt over the skin kept the infections away. Now to be honest, for my life, I can't tell the reason why you won't write me one solitary word. I wish to God you had to take my place for about a month. Then you would know something about it. I have to shovel and chop and rally out at all times of the night. Our regiment can't muster over 500 able-bodied men. So you can see whether or not it wears on them, that's all.
The horrid hardships I endured on this retreat may I never again witness. Many of the boys had not a mouthful to eat. I had nothing but hard bread, the sight of which became sickening. You know how I despise pork in all its forms, yet I was forced to eat raw pork and drink from the track of a mule. Every rag on me was dripping with mud and water, and I could hardly drag one leg after the other. In short, I was all gone up, and that so too. Roland E. Bowen, Millbury, Private, 15th, Massachusetts. As a unit went into battle, it would go through stages. First thing that would break down when they went under fire, or even if their officers gave them some confusing orders, would be their drill would break down, and they'd stop marching closely. After they fired their first volley, they would lose their drill, which is one of the reasons why the officers wanted to keep them together and without firing until they were as close as possible. The other reason was most of them weren't trained to shoot. Mm -hmm. They'd been trained to go through the motions of loading. They had not had any chance to practice with their hundreds of diaries. Soldiers remarking, the first time we fired our weapons was in this battle. I have forgot how to use a knife, fork, or plate, but God knows I ain't forgot how to get things into my salt horse box. Friday, August 22nd, eight miles more and thank God we are at Newport News. The march is up, 88 miles without washing hands or face. I am so dirty that nobody would know me. We all bathe in the salt water and go diving for oysters for we are half starved for something besides hardtack and salt horse. Roland E. Bowen, Millbury, Private, 15th, Massachusetts. Well, most infantrymen had uh, endless hours of boredom followed by more endless hours of boredom. And uh, the Army had to keep them occupied so they didn't get into too much mischief. So there was plenty of drill, followed by more drill, followed by more drill. But when they did have their free time and their moments to themselves, the men would gather together, their messmates would gather together and entertain themselves in a variety of ways. Singing, of course, was very popular at the time, and most of the men knew the songs and knew the tunes and would sit around the campfire at night singing those tunes. Uh, many of them read. Uh, the literacy rate was quite high, so that most men could read uh, and write. They kept journals, wrote letters. Um, they wanted to make sure the people back home knew about the great adventure they were involved in. And once in a while, they got into a little bit of mischief as well. Uh, the occasion they would find themselves uh, able to get a hold of liquor, although selling liquor to soldiers was illegal. And occasionally they also would um, play practical jokes at each other and uh, you know, do the things that anybody at that age would do. Well, women were always a, a welcome sight in the camps, and contrary to popular belief, most women were not the sort that were, uh, shall we say, soiled doves. Most of the women that you would come in contact with belonged to relief organizations, they were part of the Sanitary Commission, which worked on improving the health and well-being of the soldier and improved the sanitation of the camps. They might belong to the Christian Commission, which worked on morale and as well as morality. Uh, they would raise money up north, uh, holding fairs to purchase supplies to bring down to the soldiers, things like books and uh, foodstuffs to improve their diet. You also had a lot of times women who worked as laundresses, seamstresses, and the men could have things repaired, and washed, and cleaned for themselves. Uh, alternatively, you also had some visits from officers' wives. So there were a variety of women you would come in contact with in the camps in the course of the war. Card playing was very important, like um, any other sort of um, leisure time activity for these soldiers, whether it be card playing or drinking or what have you. Uh, they had a hard life. The food wasn't great. They drilled constantly. If you look at the soldiers from the Army of the Potomac, sort of uh, complaining about their life. They would drill in the morning, drill in the afternoon, drill it into the early evening. It was hard. Um, so they would look for ways to relax that weren't you know, physically exer you know, exerting because they'd exerted themselves all day. Um, card playing became important simply for the fact that you could put it in your haversack and it was very little weight. Uh, one guy could carry enough cards to for four or five people. Also, um, you get the way of make a little money. Thirteen dollars a month was pretty much all a private would make, and sometimes you could find a new guy and make a little more money off him to send home to the wife and kids or to pay off your own sutler bill. Cards were very important, as with other games and other pursuits, to build camaraderie. Uh, battles, the big battles occur every few months 
Firefights occur every couple of weeks, but there's a lot of downtime. If you read again their letters and their diaries, they complain about the constant tedium and boredom. And they would use cards as a way of alleviating that kind of stress. Because boredom, as you know, can bring along another kind of stress. Um, the other thing about it is it was a way of them, uh, of bringing them closer, to find out who you liked, who you didn't like. Um, they'd play cards into the wee hours. These young boys, a long way from home, 14, 15 years old, alone in an adult's world with blood and death all around them, how do they pass the time? Playing cards on a drum head. Several different aspects of it that, that make it different. For one thing, as you can see, the most obvious uh, point that isn't the same as now, there are no numbers on these cards. So you're, you have to think pretty quickly, if the game's moving quickly, what exactly, how much, you know, the points on your card. Uh, also, the face cards only go one way. They don't have the double image. So if you twist it a certain way, you might confuse your opponent. And they can't see very quickly, again, as to what card you have. Sutlers were really brutal on the soldiers. Sutlers were businessmen who followed the army and sold soldiers whatever else they needed. Uh, candles, cigars, tobacco, clothing, alcohol. They weren't supposed to, but they would anyways. And you would run up a bill with these people because you only got paid once a month. And at the end of the month, when you, or the beginning of the month when you got paid, the sutler would take the first cut, which left you very little money. So in a way, playing cards for some people became a way of raising more money to pay off their bills and send money home. If you didn't like the person, quick deal from the bottom. Uh, you could uh, play with the face cards, not really show them as, again, like today, where we have them on both sides. If you say, put your hand on the queen's face quickly, and somebody just takes a second to think about that, and maybe they thought it was a jack or a king, they might play a card they might not normally have played. A way of making a little more money for yourself. Probably his tin cup and his sack of coffee, as well as maybe a pipe and some tobacco. Good, strong black coffee and a pipe. Those are probably the two most important things in a soldier's life. That and his comrades. Artillery was a technical branch of the Army during the Civil War. It required education, teamwork, and fast thinking. The set of skills required of an artilleryman were quite different than any other branch of the Army. Now, what did the skills in the mill workers of the Blackstone Valley offer the artillery? Well, to find out the answer to that question, let's catch up with a panel of experts. In Rhode Island, you had a disproportionately large number of uh, industrial workers compared to other states. You had people who were working in mills, um, people who had been mill mechanics, um, familiar with mechanical contrivances of the time. And in an artillery battery, it, it stated in the 1864 manual that a large proportion of the recruits should come from those trades. In a, in a battery, you have uh, wheels, cannons, uh, mechanical screws, and things like that. Um, you'd need to have artificers to be repairing equipment that was broken. Um, and it was really a very technical branch. It was the most technical branch of the U.S. Army at the time. All artillerymen had to read. You had to be able to read and write and cipher, which is do your numbers. Um, you also would need to, generally speaking, be taller than the average man because you had to be strong enough to lift and haul that cannon if the horses were shot. As well as, in the light artillery, you needed to be good with handling animals. Um, it's stated in the manual that any men who are cruel to the animals, who don't get on well with them, should be removed from the artillery. And the artillery was generally a little better trained, and our job was pretty much to be a battlefield bully. If there was something going on, say there was an infantry unit moving up, we could be thrown into a gap. Many times, all that it would take would be for a battery of Napoleons to turn, and suddenly that infantry colonel decides he's got a better place to attack down the line. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we could be pressed, but it was very rare that a light artillery battery, even if it was carried, would suffer more than 10, 15 percent casualties. The light artillery, from the very beginning of the war to the very end of the war, and the Union Army was superior to that of the, uh, of the rebels, even the rebels would frequently grudgingly admit it. 
If uh, rebels would generally fire, a gunner would be pretty much in command of his own gun and pick his own targets. If a Union battery was ordered into action, there would be six guns, and the entire battery would be concentrated on one point on the enemy line, which meant that Union counter-battery fire was brutal because they'd just keep firing at something until they wrecked it or until it was forced to withdraw. Right. But the idea of light artillery was that it was a, a rapid response, uh, almost in the, in the style of today's Rangers or other kinds of uh, commando type things. And they, they served uh, all throughout the war in, in, various, uh, in various capacities. Uh, the most famous one, of course, was at Gettysburg. And that's where I believe both Battery A and Battery B were in the line on the third day uh, at Pickett's Charge. And I, I, I may be exaggerating a little bit about this, but it seems to me that one of Pickett's misfortunes was to have the spearhead of his charging men hit the very point of the Union line that was best prepared to receive it, which was these Rhode Island batteries that could fire twice as fast and more accurately than almost any other uh, in, the, uh, in the Army. And so here's this spearhead coming across this hot field uh, coming upon the, uh, the Union Army in place uh, at, at Seminary Ridge and, uh, Cemetery Ridge and, and, and who's there to receive them but these Rhode Islanders who, who shot better and faster than almost anybody. And one of the, I think one of the reasons why that spearhead failed was because it hit the line right at, right at that point. The mini ball was your principal bull during the Civil War and a very destructive piece of metal it was. Even by today's standards, with our knowledgeable medical teams, would find it difficult to treat the kind of havoc that a mini ball would create in the human body. Now go back 135 years. Go back to a time when such terms as sterilization and antibiotics were unknown. And there was very limited knowledge about anesthetics. Pity the poor wounded soldier. Matter of fact, James McPherson, Civil War historian, wrote that the Civil War was fought at the end of the medical Middle Ages. Now we're standing here at Worcester Academy in downtown Worcester. At the time of the Civil War, there was a major hospital here that treated Civil War soldiers, principally Union soldiers. And it's not unlikely that the regimental chaplain would have as much success with a wounded soldier as a regimental surgeon. Because remember, Civil War doctors were general practitioners. They were not trained surgeons. Now, what would a Civil War doctor face in a field hospital after a major battle? One sight you're going to see around the field hospital, two miles behind the line, is going to be a pile of arms and legs. Doctors are just going to get them off, take them off 15 minutes. Arms and legs go out the window, pile up, eventually they get buried. It's going to be a very common scene. Uh, problem is, as I say, one of those rounds hits you in the arm or leg, you're going to get a compound fracture. There's going to be so much damage that the basic rule of military surgery this period is save a, save a life, not a limb. Statistics are, if you can get a man on the table, you get his arm or leg off in the first 24 hours, you can give him a three and four chance of surviving. You wait 36, 48 hours, his chances go down to two and 10. So get him on the table, get him under the anesthesia, get the arm or leg off. If it's in the chest or abdominal cavity, you send for the chaplain because the chaplain can do him more good than the surgeon can. That's the basic rules. But you hear stories you go back and read the memoirs, you hear stories about doctors being drunk, doctors staggering around. Well, if you stop and think, if you've been operating 24, 36, God help them, in some cases 72 hours, you're not going to be too steady on your feet. You're going to be operating, there's going to be ether fumes, chloroform fumes, you're going to be getting some of it. Alcohol was considered as a stimulant, so a doctor might well take a drink every now and then every few hours, but not enough to get drunk, simply to sort of anesthetize himself to the things that he was seeing and the things that he was experiencing. But if he was staggering, it was just with fatigue. That's the truth of it. 36, 24 hours, 36 hours, possibly 72 in the worst cases. Yeah, they're going to be dead on their feet. These men are going to be dead on their feet. They're going to be taking arms and legs off, one arm and leg every 15 to 20 minutes. That's the period of time. You know, you get the arm leg off, you get the patient off the table, you take a bucket of water. If you've got the extra water, you hose the table off with it. Maybe you take some water, slap it on your face, grab a cup of coffee, and then you're back to it. So obviously, I mean, 
then it's going to show up in other problems too. The, you're not going to be ligating, tying off the veins and arteries as carefully as you should. So it's a, it is a major problem. Now they went back into civilian life and they carried their lessons with them. I mean, what you have to understand is that by our standards they were crude. But if you'll pardon the pun, they were cutting edge in those days. Consider that during the Mexican War, the U.S. Army was losing men dying of disease at a ratio of 12 for every one that died in battle. By the end of the Civil War, the surgeons had reduced the ratio of deaths to disease to combat deaths to 3 to 1. Now that is a major improvement. They came up with hospital systems, organizations that remained in use right down to World War II. The basic hospital system instituted by both North and South was copied throughout Europe, remained in service until the development of the MASH unit in World War II. So, I mean, also this was a period when you get the beginnings of reconstructive surgery. Uh, the recognition that some injuries are going to be psychic in nature. In other words, they're going to be mental problems. Combat fatigue is recognized as a possible problem. They didn't call it that. They had other names for it but they did recognize that a man can simply crack. A brave soldier can crack. There can be too much stress. So you do get the beginnings of you know, treatment, rehabilitation, treatment for mental trauma, reconstructive surgery of the face, improvements in prosthetics because of the number of amputations. And they carry this into civilian life. Uh, they understood the basic need for cleanliness. They carry that back to the civilian hospitals. By 1865, your average civilian hospital was nowhere near as clean as your general military hospital. Everything was whitewashed once a week. Everything was swept out, scrubbed down. They carry this back into civilian life with them. And of course, they are more aware of the problems of surgery so that when Lister publishes his first work on antiseptic surgery, 1866, they are gonna be deeply interested and they can relate it to their own experiences and they can see the value of what he's doing now. And they will help spread the doctrine of antiseptic surgery into the civilian world. So they did not leave it, I mean, some may well have. The vast majority returned to medicine, better men, better surgeons, better physicians than they went to war, simply because they are now better trained. The monument we have reared to our regiment is not a monument to the glories of war. If that were all, it were better that the state of Massachusetts had withheld its gift, and that this granite block was sleeping in its native quarry. No one knows better than we who have seen the trampled fields, the desolated homes, the blazing towns, the agonies of the dying on such a field as this, what the horrors of war are. A war can only be justified or ennobled by a great and solemn cause, and that cause the American people had. General Devens, commemorating the monument to the 15th of Massachusetts at Gettysburg, June 2nd, 1886. Such could be written about any of the boys in the Blackstone Valley or any other of the regions of the country that answered the call, we're coming, Father Abraham. Today, we learn about the life and times of this era with the help of dedicated amateur historians, the Civil War reenactors. And they're amateur only in the sense that they are not paid. But through their hard work, their research, living encampments, we get a sense and feel for this great struggle and the implications it has to us as Americans today. Now, this is Chuck Arning, ranger with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor, thanking you for joining us today. But the conflict continues, and the emotional impact the Civil War has on us is very real. So join us next time as we look at the human interest stories that emerge from the Blackstone Valley about this great conflict.